I'd like to welcome everyone to the Reno County Commission meeting today. It is <clears throat> Tuesday, March 3rd. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and then we will have a prayer by Pastor William Green from the Macedonia Missionary Baptist Church. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. to the commissioners. Father God, we come this morning with humble hearts and bowed heads, minds of thanksgiving. You have shown us a day, Lord, that was not promised, but you reached out from your heavenly throne and allowed us to rise from our beds, being clothed in our right minds. So, Father, we wish to thank you. Now we ask your blessings to be over this meeting and over these commissioners, Lord God, that they would do the things that are pleasing in thy sight Give us all the courage and the understanding to keep holding on, looking forward to a better year, a better day. These prayers we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all. And y'all have a blessed day. Thank you, sir. No arguments. <laughs> oh, not, not today. <clears throat> not with this agenda. You know, it's a light day, and I noticed there's no members from the media here. So we can do as we will. Uh, first item is public comment. It's an opportunity we have every week for people from the community to talk to the commission. I, just, I can tell, obviously, that there's no one here from the public, but I always want to just remind uh, folks that we, one of the reasons why we meet every single week, whether it's a big agenda or a small one, is so that people from the community can come out and meet with us uh, and talk to us directly. The next item on the agenda would be <coughs> Commission and County Administrator uh, comments. Commissioner Hurst. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank our new County Administrator, Randy, for taking his day to uh, put up with me and ride around and see the county and the communities and uh, appreciate that very much. It was pretty much a full day. So uh, anyway, uh, thank you and, and the communities did show up and let him fill in any more he wants to. And the other thing is uh, we need to schedule a Quad County meeting here sometime here in the near shortly. We have those every quarter. And for those that don't know what the Quad County meeting is, uh, they are meeting representing from the commissioners from uh, Reno, Harvey, Butler, and Sedgwick County. And we get together once in a quarter to discuss things. Okay. I do not have any comments today. Uh, Randy, do you have some uh, comments? Uh, yes, I just wanted to, you know, let everyone know <clears throat> tonight there is a special meeting at the Reno County Planning Commission meeting, and this is about the boundaries of the zoning for the, for the extending it in the southeast part of Reno County. This item does not involve amending existing zoning regulations or anything about wind energy regulations. That will be at a later time. Um, and public comments will be accepted on the boundary map item only. So I just kind of wanted to mention that, and if there's any future updates, it will make them either tonight or at their March 19th meeting, which is their normal monthly meeting. Randy, what time and where is this at? That is 4.30 at the Reno County Public Works facility, which is 600 Scott Boulevard in South Hutch. Thank you. Um, and then, as Commissioner Hurst mentioned, I did, you know, spend all, pretty much all day Friday <laughs> going out in the mainly southern part of Reno County. It was a great experience. I appreciate Commissioner for taking me and introducing me to people from, you know, Fair, Fairfield School and many cities in the uh, area. So it was a great experience to see Reno County other than just what's in Hutchinson. So that was great. Thank you. Um, then just kind of wanted to comment that we got some February 2020 sales tax information which shows the December 2019 sales tax was lower, what was collected was lower than the years 2015, 16, 17, 18. So for some reason December 19 we had lower sales tax and I know 
Leslie mentioned that she was concerned about this also. We'll be watching trends to see if sales tax picks back up, but it was lower than previous years. Was it significantly lower? I mean, I don't, I don't need the exact number, but are we talking 1%, 2%, 10%? Somewhere, is there a ballpark that you can help uh, me with? I can give you kind of in numbers about 40 to 80,000. Okay. So it's probably about five to 10% lower. That's pretty it was a good amount lower, which is what surprised us. Okay. So we wanted to let you, I wanted to let you know, just we will be watching that trend to see if we can figure out why or if that continues or if it's just one bad month. Okay. That's all I had. Okay. Uh, County Councilor, do you have any uh, comments? Yes, I know this board and, and uh, members of the public are interested in the uh, progress of the uh, uh, Wind Energy Appeals case pending in district court. And since we last met, the judge conducted a status conference telephone call uh, with the attorneys for the parties. And as a result of that, uh, the court established a schedule for uh, the, the county and the uh, intervening parties to file written responses to the motion for summary judgment. Uh, deadlines for that to be submitted, uh, uh, which I believe is March 16, for those to be submitted. And then uh, Pretty Prairie Wind will have a, a time following that to respond to those responses. And ultimately, that the court has scheduled at this time uh, its hearing on the motion for summary judgment for April 13. That's a Monday at 1:30 in the afternoon. I think the court has allowed two hours for argument, and of course, that open court hearing that, that hearing is open open to the public would be in Division uh, Division Two of the District Court from the Judge Chambers. I should remind everybody that. Um, Matters scheduled before the court are subject to change at the judge's discretion, depending on what may develop between now and then. So I wouldn't say that that's locked in stone, but I know of no reason today uh, why it, it, you know, it won't occur at that time. But should that happen, we'll, I'll advise you accordingly. I appreciate that, John. As you and I have discussed, I have some people, I've had people at different times come up and ask me what's going on with the wind yeah. case and where is this at? So. Your updates, even though there's maybe nothing new or exciting that's going on, at least lets people know that the process is continuing. And so as you as things come up, as you've said, you'll let us know, but it's also good to let the public know that this is still in process. That's right. And of course the summary motion for summary judgment was based on one issue and that is the validity of the protest petitions. Mm -hmm. And whether the court uh, finds that the county's decision accepting the protest and approving it is upheld or for whatever reason uh, uh, the judge uh, rules against that that will control events which transpire after after that and it's pure speculation as to as to what might happen so it's just uh, one issue to be decided on that day it, it may or may not determine uh, the outcome of the case okay thank you so realistically, you're looking at March 16th, if I understood that right, for the summary judgment. I mean, for the for the uh, county and the and the intervener to present their written response. written response. Right. And then uh, I think it's April 6th for uh, uh, pretty <coughs> <coughs> to file its response to that, and then 10 days later, uh, court's going to uh, hear an oral argument from counsel for the parties as to whether or not the motion So this is going to go for a while. Yeah. Okay. okay. So it's roughly April 13th, 16th, yeah. and then that estimated time that the court might have open. Well, the, the, the court uh, court's um, uh, reporter provided certain dates and times in which the yeah. judge was available and asked for the parties to, if we could reach a consensus on when everybody would be available. And April 13 was the day that was decided upon. So All right. at this time, that, that's when it's going to happen. Yeah. Subject to, <laughs> subject to change. Yeah. And as you've said, it's all in ju the judge's hands as to what, when they meet, and this all goes forward. That's right. And then the, 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 I mean, the judge would want to have it heard on that day. Something would have to come up, causing the judge to, yeah. um, to, to reschedule that. And I'm not. I don't have. And even in raising the uh, uh, prospect of that, I'm not all suggestions going to happen, or I know of anything that would right. cause that to happen. But yeah. 
sometimes people focus on a date and then they get real disappointed if it if something doesn't happen and uh, these matters are beyond our control. Yeah, but I think the key is just as you've done today. This is what the plan is, this is what the process is. It's in the judge's hands, not our hands. And we hope that this is what happens if, for people that are following it. That's correct. So, right. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, <coughs> uh, additions to the agenda, Commissioner Hurst, do you have anything to add to the agenda? No, sir. Uh, Randy, I believe you have a couple items you'd like to add for, dis for discussion items? Yes. Um, Dave Johnson, the EMS director, is here. And there's a couple changes in this capital expenditures that don't really, just for your information, so I'd like to add for him to come up and talk. And then. Okay, so, just real quick, so we'll make that uh, agenda item uh, seven. Uh -huh. Let's just put up a new uh, seven, eight. discussion item. Yeah, let's we'll just, we'll just call it 7A discussion item. Okay. okay. EM, EMS in Arlington, right? The EMS director and his capital. No, but I mean, he's talking about uh, the ambulance, ambulance, purchase, ambulance purchases. Capital, oh, ambulance purchases. Capital items. Capital. Okay. Okay, so discussion on ambulance purchases is, is uh, discussion item 7A. Okay. Thanks. Okay. And then also, um, Nick, the health director, about coronavirus. And then uh, discussion item 7B will be Nick Baldetti, uh, director of uh, public health, talking about the coronavirus and Reno County's preparedness for it. Okay? Thank you. Anything else you'd like to add, Randy? No. Okay. Joe, is there anything that you'd like to add? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. And I have nothing as well. <clears throat> Seeing no other items on that, we'll go to the consent agenda. I would accept a motion to approve the consent agenda as submitted by staff. I would move to approve the consent agenda as submitted by staff with total vouchers of $323,734.52. I will second that. Any discussion? No. Seeing none, please call the roll. <laughs> Commissioner Hurst? Yes. Commissioner Bush? Yes. All right, we're jumping right to item 7A. Dave, I believe you're up. If you'd like to uh, state your name, your occupation, what you do for the people in the audience on TV, and uh, <laughs> and then just uh, go with your, with your presentation. All right, uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, it's Dave Johnston. I'm the uh, EMS chief uh, for Reno County. I, I had a short meeting yesterday with Randy, and it was over kind of discussion of some capital expenditures on ambulances. It already, it's already been budgeted for uh, this year. I was wanting to make some changes uh, in those purchases at, at a cost savings. I'll preface that. So we had originally budgeted last year for a uh, four-wheel drive ambulance. Uh, we're waiting for some decisions to be made on where we're going to store that. I think ultimately where that will be stationed. With that being said, I, I would like to go ahead with the purchase of a regular two-wheel drive ambulance. Along with that was a plan to remount another ambulance where we remove the patient compartment box off of and put it onto a new chassis. We typically do that uh, one time for every ambulance. We'll build a new ambulance. That box will be remounted once. That way we almost double the life out of that box. So we really get our, our value out of that. We had budgeted about $118,000 for that last year. The quote has come back higher and, and I want to explain why it's come back higher. It's come back, there were some electrical issues with the, the ambulance box we'd like to go ahead at this time and just replace the electrical system in that box. So we went from 118,000 up to about 100, it's almost 125,000 on that. Uh, the difference on the four wheel drive ambulance, we budgeted in the neighborhood of $220,000. I do believe we're gonna be down in the neighborhood of 195, 190 to 195 on just a standard two wheel drive ambulance we build new. So if we move that, even with the increased cost in the uh, remount, there still should be about a savings in capital expenditures of about eighteen thousand uh, dollars this year. Uh, I just wanted to bring that before you before we move forward at all and, and gather input and see how the commission would like me to move forward on that. Ron, your thoughts? I know that. The storage of ambulance is, is the big uh, issue with regarding to the location that uh, really could utilize a four-wheel drive at times. Uh, uh, I know that uh, I, I, 
I would like to see a four-wheel drive at some time uh, in the future. Uh, I understand the cost savings. I understand the problem with being able to store a four-wheel drive because of the additional height and uh, that's, that's needed. And uh, the location that uh, was planned on being in doesn't have the storage space right now. There's been conversations between the fire department out there and, as you know, and uh, many times, and the EMS out there. But uh, I don't know that there's a solid answer yet. And I wouldn't want to put off having myself, I wouldn't want to put off having a good, dependable ambulance when needed uh, just for, for that purpose, that maybe some things can be worked out a little on down the line. That's my original, that's my thought right now. Uh, even though once in a great while, four-wheel drive is needed uh, I think we need to proceed I, I, I appreciate the information and the dollar savings and what it amounts to and why you're looking at it myself I guess my thoughts are is I'd like to see that four-wheel drive in your next budget so that we get it as soon as possible yeah. I agree with what you're doing now it'd be nice to get these ambulance back in service and get it get everything up to speed um, to Commissioner Hurst comment I mean Yes, I think we've been working with the hospital and with the EMS, uh, uh, and I'm on that group uh, mm -hmm. with uh, Gary and now, of course, with Randy, where we've been uh, trying to get kind of a uh, general overlay done uh, before we come back with the recommendation. I think we're close to being ready to do that, aren't we, Dave? Yeah, we are, actually, and that's what I met with Randy uh, yesterday about is kind of discuss what, what a five-year plan looks like to get our fleet where it needs to be at. And, and in that plan is next year bringing the, the four-wheel drive ambulance back right. for discussion. I, yeah. I, I do believe that we can have that matter resolved, hopefully uh, within a short time frame with the uh, uh, new county administrator on board. We've kind of been in a holding pattern for discussions on that. And with Commissioner Hurst, I think we're ready to get down and, and tackle that issue. So we know- Well, that's been one of the unfortunate things that we had to take quite a break after uh, your predecessor left so you came on board to look at it, then you had to look at it, and then Gary uh, left, and now we have Randy, we're bringing Randy up to speed, but the real issue has always been twofold. One is, what's the five-year plan? Where do ambulance services need to be in Reno County, and what does that cost? Um, I don't disagree or have any issues with ambulance service being where it's at, but before we start doing two, $300,000 improvements on facilities, we need to make sure that our equipment's in the right place. And it is unfortunate, and I know it's caused some consternation uh, in the communities, but uh, I'd rather have slow government than bad government. And so we're going to have good government, and we're going to give the people what they need. We're going to give them the equipment where they need it. And that's why I'm encouraging you to make sure that the top number one priority, which I will support Commissioner Hurst, is that four-wheel drive vehicle. And maybe purchasing that in the front part of the year as opposed to the end of the year so we have it in whatever station we decide to put it at sooner. I'd agree with that. I think one of the plans that, that I'm working together on the fleet to affect that is is that uh, we, we have a mixed fleet of, of different manufacturers, different models out there. And, and my goal is to standardize that and, and we start wor working with a particular manufacturer that, that meets our, our needs so that we can have one in the pipeline, we're ready to go uh, right at the, the first of the year. So that, that's my hope anyway. Uh, Randy, do you have any thoughts or comments you'd like to add to this discussion? Um, just that, you know, I agree with the, com I like the conversation, and Dave had mentioned that four-wheel drive would probably be in next year's request. But the five-year plan for the capital does show that four-wheel drive will be next year, just moving it back one year. Okay. So. All right. Anything else, Ross? Nothing. Right. I appreciate, appreciate the time. All right. Thank and you very much. the energy you've taken to work on this whole budget, and Bob, you too. You've been involved in this. Well, I, I'm ready, and I, I'm, we'll get to with the county uh, administrator on board now. We'll get additional meetings scheduled, and we've got some more information to share with you on recommendations. So I'm looking forward yeah, to it. Yeah, let's get with Ken, see if we can't get something set up sooner rather than later. All right, can do. All right, thanks, Dave. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Okay, that was item 7A discussion on uh, ambulance purchases. Uh, Nick, do you want to talk about coronavirus? Coronavirus, and uh, now do you call it coronavirus or do you call it COVID-19? What's I mean, I like coronavirus because I don't like corona, but 
I know the legal <laughs> term is more COVID-19. So what are your thoughts on how we should start referring to this? Well, sure. Uh, Nick Baldetti, Director, Public Health Department. Um, the legal medical term is COVID-19 now. Uh, originally when... Um, Do you think enough people in the community know it as COVID-19? or? or I think it's interchangeable in terms of coronavirus okay. um, and COVID-19 now. Um, the, the original, the, the reason, let me backtrack. Coronavirus is a um, strain of particular virus that at its most um, microbiological um, form has a crown-like look around the, the cell, the viral body of itself. Thus, it's been coined, this particular strain is called coronavirus. Um, this particular coronavirus shares its um, gestation, if you will, with similar coronaviruses, much like SARS, MERS. Um, and originally, before it gained its medical term of COVID-19, it was called novel coronavirus 2019. Novel being because we have not seen the viral strain before. 2019 is because it showed up in 2019. So they basically compressed it to try and uh, disenfranchise it with kind of standard coronavirus that we see on an annual basis to COVID-19 to try and differentiate it. So okay. anyway, does that help? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Any, anything that you say is going to help. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, at least, um, at least this uh, uh, non-medical person. Sure. Sure. Well, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I, I would start with um, – uh, County Administrator Randy Partington sent me an email yesterday. Uh, looked like there was a few questions from uh, the commission to which I'm uh, I'm happy to kind of provide an update, then uh, give some some more general information. Then I'm happy to field any questions. Um, I, I don't proclaim to be an expert, but at the same time, um, if there's anything that I need to get back with further information, uh, I'm happy to do so. Um, some of the questions that I received from, from Randy um, was just an update on current conversations happening at the state level with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, um, and then what those discussions have been, and maybe the kind of the latest thoughts from the state. Um, obviously, the Kansas Department of Health and Environment is, has been uh, generally on top of keeping track of the newest information coming out from uh, CDC and Department of Health at the national level. Um, right now, the uh, Kansas Department of Health and Environment puts on weekly calls for the local level that we jump on every, every Thursday in regard to updating both uh, the national status of COVID-19 in the United States, as well as um, any changes that have transpired in terms of the, the procedural recommendations for our response as well at the local level uh, from Kansas Department of Health and Environment. Um, there's also uh, Kansas Department of Health and Environment in uh, consultation and collaboration with the Kansas Department of Emergency Management has also been advocating for local, um, local health departments and local emergency management departments to begin to have conversations with local stakeholders in our community in terms of what our um, response would look like really in terms of just planning and preparing for uh, when when COVID-19 presents in our local communities. And unfortunately, um, because this is a respiratory illness, uh, it, it is a matter of when versus if it is gonna come to our, uh, come to our local communities. Um, if, you, if you looked at the news today, I believe there's 15 states that have either uh, positive uh, individual coronavirus in the United States and or uh, persons under investigation. Um, the, the death toll is, is up to six, uh, five of which are in King County, and then one is in Snohomish County in Washington um, with strong epidemiological links, uh, disease investigation links, which bas basically just means that we can, we can link um, that they spent time together, um, how they're associated with each other, uh, meaning that we can, we can track the disease uh, linkage to time spent with each other versus kind of a novel inception of someone who we show has not had any kind of time spent with someone who is known to have the virus and someone else just got sick. That's potentially more troublesome than um, when someone con 
contracts the disease and we know who, where, or why um, from a disease investigation standpoint. Um, transitioning into just kind of an update of what we've done here locally. Um, you know, we've been working with Adam down in emergency management. Uh, we actually convened our community medical partners uh, on February 13th at the at the health department as a as a preliminary meeting to begin the conversations about preparedness for both our individual organizations and um, as a community how we would respond. So we had the we had the entire healthcare sector present at that meeting. So health department. Uh, representation from uh, Hutchinson Regional Healthcare System, uh, Summit Surgical, Hutch Clinic, um, Prairie Star um, Medical Center were all at the meeting. And uh, essentially having the conversation about how if uh, an individual who meets the screening criteria were to present at one of our facilities, what our roles would be, how, how our particular facilities would respond to um, that presentation. Um, you know, the public health department has an investigation piece in terms of our role um, versus, you know, a, a, um, a hospital versus a, a clinic has a, 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 an acute service delivery to, to that individual as well. But obviously we want to, um, we want to isolate that individual in the facility. How are we gonna, how are we gonna administer care? Um, how long do we hold that individual? Uh, what transportation looks like? Those are the kind of conversations that we're having as a community. And um, as a result of the initial meeting that we've held on February 13th, uh, our, at the health department, our disease investigator, epidemiologist, Elliot Custer, uh, is providing weekly updates of the most up-to-date information in terms of what's funneling down from the national level and then also from KDHE in terms to our partners. And we are consistently, um, we're getting more and more requests for more and more people to be involved in that, um, that email listserv. And then obviously he's involved um, with any phone calls in terms of questions in regard to response and, um, and and what our community will do as a medical community in terms of responding should we have uh, a person of interest and or a positive COVID-19 present in our community. Um, yeah, essentially um, the, the question that I, the third question somewhat that I received from Randy is um, understanding that public health needs to control local training, potential isolation and quarantine. So um, I, I would just change the, the word control to maybe lead or act as a resource for local training um, because we are a direct interface with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment and by proxy an extension of Secretary of, of Health's power. I, I would comment on the difference between potential isolation and quarantine Whereas um, isolation is a, is a routine practice in communicable disease and that uh, generally an individual who uh, tests positive for a communicable disease we discuss, they need to isolate themselves uh, from, from others, whether that's within a home or within a separate place of residence versus uh, the act of quarantine is actually a, a, a generally um, that's, a, that's a legal act as administered as uh, the health officer at the local jurisdictional level as an extension, the proxy of the Secretary of Health's um, power to uh, legally quarantine somebody in place. And then if, if, we were to, um, if we were to conduct such a quarantine, um, then we would have to have uh, local law enforcement as well to be able to enforce that quarantine. Generally speaking, um, most people voluntarily um, take part in isolation and or quarantine. In fact, uh, we kind of loosely refer voluntary quarantine, but that's that can be defined as isolation as well. If we if we start throwing around the word quarantine, it's really because we're throwing we're throwing legalese behind behind the act. So just wanted to kind of hopefully differentiate those two. Uh, I touched on generally uh, the Hutchinson Regional Healthcare Center uh, or system, as well as uh, Prairie Star and Hutchinson Clinic, are very, uh, very proactive in terms of the response and the planning they're having at their local facilities, and they continue to be in consultation and, and communication with us. Again, our part is more disease investigation. 
uh, in terms of what the health department is, and then also just trying to disseminate the mo most accurate information possible to those to those facilities. Um, most likely, individuals, if they were to present with sy symptoms, they're going to present at the hospital, they're going to present at the clinic, or they're going to present at Prairie Star Med Center. Potentially, um, we don't have many other clinics, but they may present at some in surgical, maybe at uh, the little clinic, say at, uh, at Dillon's on 30th. Uh, but generally speaking, all of these stakeholders are prepared for present uh, presentation of someone who has symptoms and then they have a set protocol in terms of how to vet the likelihood or, or risk factors that they might have in terms of being, uh, being uh, COVID-19 uh, susceptible. I think that's, that's answered kind of the questions I received from from uh, county administrator. I guess I might pause right there in terms of any sp um, questions that might have spurred from, from that conversation, or I could just continue with a, a few more things of information. <coughs> and uh, I guess I'll, I'll pause for a second to see it. Well, I've, got, <coughs> I've got several questions. I, okay. I guess maybe this is from my own knowledge, but I'm sure. thinking if I'm curious about this, probably somebody else's too. So let's say I fly out to uh, uh, New York for a business meeting and touch something that somebody else touched that had coronavirus and then I touch my face and I get it. All right, I start the process and I fly back to Hutch mm -hmm. and I'm not feeling good. So what are my symptoms like? How, how, how different are they from like the flu or a common cold? Yeah, that's actually part of the difficulty. Uh, of, that's that's of what I understand. Those, yeah. So. Um, Generally, I mean, the fact of the matter is, is we are in the thick of uh, flu season, mm -hmm. and this is a particularly um, um, tough flu season this year, um, as well as it's 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 cold season, um, and some strains of cold are actually coronavirus. Um, so, um, it it is difficult, and so the differentiator in terms of trying to classify. Uh, someone to to know that we need to test is in asking those questions. So knowing that you traveled uh, in this particular yeah yeah, you yeah know, let's hypothetical. Just, let's just stick with this. <laughs> knowing knowing that you traveled to New York City, um, you know obviously you went to a major transportation hub. Um, uh, who who uh, do you know that was in attendance of whatever your business meeting was? Is there any at risk in terms of the individuals that you? Um, that, that you communicate, most likely you would be speaking to a member of the staff at the public health department or disease investigation, and trying to um, illuminate whether there's any at-risk factors that are surrounding you mm -hmm. outside of the fact that you simply had intercontinental travel okay. um, to, a, to, to a major international hub in terms of New York City. Um, if we can delineate that there's no necessarily, necessarily at-risk factors in terms of who you met with, but know that you travel to a major hub, um, you probably, your risk factor would be low um, versus if we know that, say, your business meeting was an individual who spent time in, uh, let's just say Italy, which is currently battling its own um, outbreak right now, your risk level will probably rise, in which case we would look at the algorithms that are being pushed out by CDC um, and we may, we may or may not test. Um, so that's just a lot of information you're trying to collect. Good example is I felt like I felt really bad on Friday. Mm -hmm. I went into same day care and they asked me a few questions. They tested me for the flu and they said, go home and take Mucinex. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, could I have had coronavirus? They didn't ask me about my travel. They didn't yeah. ask me about where I've been. I mean, no one asked me about any of that kind of stuff. Well, most likely, no, you don't have coronavirus. I'm pretty but, confident I don't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but at um, the same time, I don't really know, and, and I have flu symptoms, Yeah, and I got a fever that night. It, it's going to be, um, it is going to be contingent upon both uh, the individual and the medical provider, okay. which is part of the planning, that knowing when someone presents with um, a fever, yep. uh, tight chest, um, generally is lethargic, mm -hmm. um, that it should it should click that okay i just need to ask a few travel questions have you been out of the country lately have you gone to any major international hubs of transportation 
if you check one of those boxes yes okay let's ask a few more clarifying questions and that's part of just getting everyone onto the same page again um, and unfortunately again it's not a matter of uh, if it's going to present but when right it's a respiratory virus it, it in some respects it's just like the flu we know at some point it's just going to be here um, and at some point uh, I think the reality is also that um, our resources in terms of disease investigation to conduct an investigation upon every positive COVID-19 is going to be strained in some capacity and so the actual response from the public health and medical system is it's it's a fluid situation, but right now I don't know that it's fully sustainable in the long term. So my next question, not beating us into, I'm sorry, but I'm, no, go right I'm, just, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm, just, go right I'm just very interested in this. I, I think everyone else is as well. So the test for coronavirus, is it a unique test or does, or like, would it show up in like the regular lab work you do where there'd be indicators? You know, you get the lab work, it's yeah. got all those things, like two pages. Mm -hmm. Are there indicators in there that say, hey, we should look for coronavirus or is it a, is it a unique test just for coronavirus? It's a unique test okay. in terms of testing for uh, COVID-19. So, um, and the and the reason being is because it is a novel, it's a novel strain of the COVID virus. Okay. So traditional tests that you receive right now uh -huh. doesn't test for this strain, and so the unique test takes, um, uh, if I if I'm remembering correctly, so don't don't take one for one, but I believe it's sputum and um, lung. Uh, mucus sample both that has to be sent to a specific lab that has the ability to test which uh, in the last week Kansas Department of Health and Environment um, is now a lab that can actually test for those so which is good we have that capacity within the state of Kansas. So if you think I've got coronavirus you would take samples mm -hmm. if you will and you would send them up to Topeka uh -huh. and then they would test them and they would come back with false or negative. Right. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. Okay and you, do we know what that timeline is like? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, so I'm just going to give a best guess estimate in terms of other lab samples, which it would be in the realm of two to three days. Okay. For which, in that time lag from receiving those lab responses, we most likely would look look for you to voluntarily <coughs> isolate yourself if we suspect that there's a potential of having a positive coronavirus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ron, jump in there. Just I've been one, talking a lot. One question. No, that's fine. Just yeah. One question. Uh, uh, let's say that you do take a trip you're in a major hub or whatever uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> what is the uh, incubation time to where it can be tested yeah so show up uh, yeah so within uh if if you're um can't think of the right term if you're exposed there we go if you're exposed to the coronavirus generally speaking incubation is um i believe it's within a week and a half and then symptoms would show up um within that week and a half, so two to 14 days of being exposed to the virus. The, again, one of the other difficulty, well, there are <coughs> many, there's many difficulties to COVID-19, but one of the difficulties is in a generally healthy individual, the symptoms may show up um, as very minor symptoms, if at all. So, so there's still um, conversations happening at the international level that some people may be COVID-19 positive and maybe asymptomatic, they're not showing any symptoms at all, which just means that people could be walking around spreading the virus and we don't even know that they're sick. Um, but that has not been confirmed yet, but it is something that's being researched right now. But generally speaking, what we do know <clears throat> is that for most people, you're just showing minor symptoms, much like you, you contracted a cold, you know, and you could be spreading it just like, you know, just like any other strain of coronavirus that might be spreading already. Um, and, and spreading the spreading it, and then you recover, but it's out. Whoops, it's out there um, everywhere that you you've been traveling. So, um, but that that two to fourteen day window, um, generally speaking, when symptoms, whether it's mild or severe, it, is uh, is the uh, is that window for for being able to test. But for being able to test and yeah. see whether you have it or not. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's uh -huh. the only question I have. Okay. Go ahead. Back to you, Bob. Oh, thanks. <laughs> with the well, with the testing. Yeah. Who pays for that? 
Uh, right now, it's just Candace Department of Health and right. Health and Environment. So if I if I get the coronavirus testing, it's not going to show up in my insurance. There's no special testing cost, anything like that. It should. It should okay, good. Right. If that question's come up, the second, uh, I try to make it my final question. Uh, so there have been a number Doesn't of deaths. Have to be. Well, <laughs> but there have been a number of deaths, and there's this. And while I've, I haven't seen any statistics on people that have died of coronavirus, so the question I have is, uh, there's an assumption out there that it's the elderly or people with with prior health problems. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? Not accurate? I have some. I mean, I've heard people say, well, the coronavirus, if you're healthy, it's not a big deal. You just take your medicine, you quarantine, you go through everything, you come out of it, it could be fine. But again, if you're elderly or if you have uh, prior health issues, mm -hmm. then you're susceptible for it being fatal. That's just what I've heard. Mm -hmm. Is that is that an accurate statement, do you think, or not, or do you know? I would say at this time that is an accurate statement. Okay. So um, much like we know about the flu, for example, um, for a healthy individual with a healthy immune system, yeah, the flu, uh, if you actually contract true influenza, it's going to knock you down for about a week. But you're going to recover with modern medicine. Um, much like, let's be relatable to a standard coronavirus in terms of the standard cold that you get. For most people, you don't even take time off of having a, of a cold for most. Um, you know, you don't feel very good for a few days, but you rebound pretty easily. Um, much like the standard cold, influenza, those um, elderly who have, uh, you know, just a, a generally a weaker immune system in terms of their age and or immunocompromised individuals. So we're talking about our young children and individuals who for whatever underlying health conditions have an, uh, a compromised immune system, they are the individuals that are more susceptible in terms of should um, any communicable disease for that matter uh, find spread in a certain population, th those are the individuals that we most concern ourselves with. Um, but for, for general purposes, the standard population of healthy immune systems, it's, it's not, it, it is a novel virus for which we don't know everything yet. And it is a fluid situation as more infor information we understand um, comes out, it could change things. But at this point, it truly is, if, you, if you're a healthy individual, um, I don't know that it's alarm bell ringing. It's really, yes, elderly and immunocompromised populations that really we, we attempt to protect. Um, I know there's research happening uh, in multiple organizations nationally and internationally to try and find a, a vaccine for coronavirus. I don't think that's something that we should hang our hat on. But again, uh, much like if we were to relate this to influenza, it's why it's vitally important to, um, to, to vaccinate and, and get your flu shot every year because we, we, as public health, advocate on the aspect of herd immunity. Um, so if we, have ten if we have a population of 10 individuals and one individual is immunocompromised, but we have nine individuals who receive their flu shot, we're essentially protecting as a matter of uh, population. We're protecting that individual to try and bolster that uh, influenza, in this case, coming in, and we lessen the potentiality of that one individual contracting influenza versus if we only have a 50% vaccination rate, now we have four people in, uh, in addition to the fifth person who cannot receive any types of vaccine that now is a window for, uh, that, that, uh, for influenza to break into the population, if that makes sense. That's the concept of human herd immunity for which um, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a public good, not only for the individual, but also for the population as a whole to protect our, our friends, family, and neighbors. So. Thanks for answering our questions. I appreciate your patience. Is there anything else you want to cover? You had a few things I thought yeah, before I think, we took a break. Yeah, um, I, I think I just want to provide some context. I, I handed out, you know, um, this information. I, it's, uh, it'll be part of the meeting minutes for today's meeting. I'm also going to, um, it's a coronavirus disease, some frequently asked questions. We're all, we also currently link to the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. It's website on the Reno County Health Department's page. Um, but also this two-page uh, handout that I provided the board today. I do just want to provide a little bit of context in terms of, you know, I know COVID-19 is receiving a lot of uh, information in the media right now. Um, th this is a few few days laggard. Um, 
but I know there's been six deaths of COVID-19 in, in the United States as of today, um, all isolated within within Washington. But um, this data for COVID-19, I, I just want to share in contrast to influenza in the United States, um, just to provide something to think <coughs> through in terms of providing numbers. So as of February 21st, 2020, there were 75,000 cases reported in mainland China. Um, of those 75,000, there's been 2,239 deaths. Okay, as of today, uh, again, I don't, have, um, I don't have the updated numbers, so I know this is a little delayed, um, so I'll add the deaths. I know there's been six deaths in the United States. Um, I believe it's 50 cases among um, now, as of today, uh, in terms of U.S. citizens that have traveled abroad and come back into the United States. If we compare that to influenza numbers currently in the United States, there's 32 to 45 million people in the United States who showcase influenza-like uh, symptoms. There's 14 to 21 million who have seen their physician for those, those symptoms. At least 310,000 to 560,000 hospitalizations as a result of, of influenza-like symptoms. And estimated 18,000 to 40,000 deaths uh, associated to influenza-like symptom, symptoms and influenza. And that's, a, that's as of today from the Centers for Disease Control weekly U.S. Influenza Surveillance Report. So I just, I just state that to provide context that while we should maintain our awareness with COVID-19, influenza has been around for years and we are in the thick of a really bad flu season. And so it's very important that the same um, the same steps you would take to keep yourself healthy during flu season is in wash your hands, cover your mouth, uh, try not to touch you know public uh, public you know doorknobs and things of that nature, fist bump instead of handshake, things like that are the same exact steps that you should be taking for COVID. But we should also, we should also be aware that influenza is already here to stay, and let's really focus on. Um, you know, general respiratory illness versus kind of isolating simply to this novel virus that is, um, you know, is simply making its way in the world of international and globalization that we have today. So, anyway, that would be my final comment, unless you had any questions of that. No, I don't. Okay. Thank you, Nick. That's very informative. Yep. Okay, we've had addition to the agenda. We've gone through both of those. <coughs> Uh, time for executive session. Uh, I believe we do want to have an executive session, Randy. So yes. I would make a motion that we adjourn to executive session at uh, 9.55 until 10.15 with uh, Randy Partington and Renee Harris in attendance to talk about uh, personnel matters. At that time, during this meeting, there will be no formal action taken by the council, uh, by the commission. I think I covered everything, didn't I? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That's I'll my motion. Second. Then. Okay. We have a motion to second. Any discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Please call the roll. Commissioner Harris. Yes. Commissioner Harris. Yes. That means we've got a five-minute break.